Welcome to Furries Taking the Bread Pill. I like how the podcast am... name changes every time. It's like Furries Get Bread Pill, Furries <laughs> Taking the Bread Pill, Furries Taking bread a Suppository, furries. I don't know. Bread Pill of the Furriness. <laughs> the Bread Pill Suppository. <laughs> you just, you just bread take, Suppository? Like, you just take all, a all loaf. All you're basically doing is you're just taking a baguette and just shoving up your ass. No, see, Bad Dragon makes bread now. Do they? That, that sounds great. That sounds like a great way to get a yeast infection. A <laughs> yeast infection. <laughs> God, I can't believe you... But up, but but up. I can't believe you've done this. This is a podcast. <laughs> This is a great start. Do we have to redo the uh, intro now? No, I think, we'll keep I think one this. of the best We're videos I saw on that Vosh thing was, uh, you know, I hope these guys don't get big because then all of a sudden people will take leftism less seriously. And I was like, well, you know, I hope that we do get big so that people will realize that we take furries more seriously. Well, I, I think it's I think it's less taking leftism less, ser- less seriously and more realizing that leftism can have fun too oh yeah, well, yeah it's like it's like the literal well kropotkin talks about that in his luxury uh thing oh and, so he does but um yeah if we want to get started with uh we read I, mean, I don't chapters... want to be taken seriously as a furry though just putting that out there hey i i take my furry i'm a post furry i'm a post furry <laughs> what do you think deruda's uh fucking persona would be i don't fucking know man literal wait who deruda a uh, French postmodern philosopher. Um, what about Foucault? Foucault it would definitely be like some kind of um, lizard. Yeah, he'd be some kind of lizard. Foucault would be a kobold, a robold, if you will. <laughs> Stop! Uh, oh God, no. Foucault maybe a French Polynesian iguana. Oh God, no, no, that's crazy, Lacat. Don't do that. Stop. <laughs> Hey, at least it's at least we're not talking about Debord here. Oh, true. Fucking... <laughs> oh God, iguanas, yeah. Debord, more like Deboring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me let me just let me just make Hegel 3.0. But if Hegel is so great. Why didn't they make a Hegel too? Well, they did. What do you think Marx was? That's pretty much what Marx was. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Marx was Hegel in Adam Smith's Love Child. <laughs> Marx read off of Dolly Parton's notes. So actually, funny story. I was reading. I was reading this article that was basically like how Marx explicitly rejects the labor theory of value. <laughs> I was just really? like, yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? I, he was the one that posited it. Hey, are we still in the intro? Uh, we, we, <laughs> we're just uh, talking, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> Hold on, let me actually. Is it. this our oh, theme song? We're not that. <laughs> we should have a really long, like, 80s Saturday morning cartoon theme song. <laughs> well, we already have the theme song. We have a theme song? We do? The opening and closing of the podcast. Do you any of you listen to the podcast that we make? No. Do we? <laughs> Fucking crazy. Oh, yeah, I remember now. The bumpers. Yeah. The fucking Vaporwave song. I thought that song was sick, and you guys were like, we should have a theme song. He's like, we do! Look, I forgot we have Vaporwave. <laughs> oh my god. This is this is going to hell in a handbasket. Can we... <laughs> that's, the next, that's the next name of this podcast. Yeah. Alright. <laughs> so, we went through chapters 8 and 9 today, and 8 was, uh... What was it? Ways and means. Ways and for whatever reason, I just keep thinking of my U.S. government class, and I was like, "Why is he talk about Nancy Pelosi and the Ways and Means Committee?" Oh my God! Stop. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this chapter—I don't know—I wasn't too interested. Chapter eight is kind of a low chapter for me. Oh, it's a quick one too. It's kind of a blurb. Not not only that, but like chapters eight and nine, kind of like they. They're kind of like a non sequitur from the rest of the book. Chapter nine is. I think there's a there's a good segue in between the two of them. Well, honestly, chapter eight kind of feels like he compressed um, the Communist Manifesto into one chapter. Mm. Uh, kinda. Like the entirety of Marx's uh, thing. Well, I mean, he's he's Kropotkin's not a Marxist though. He, re- he rejects the uh, the idea of labor theory of value. He said that like in the first chapter. Mm. Yeah, but 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 if we if we if we are to take that uh, article. 
that I, that I just discussed uh, seriously, then Marx also rejected the labor theory of, theory of value, which who, who means the fuck that wrote this article. I, let me let me fucking find it and link it. If to it's you. on Medium, then I don't care. But like, <laughs> no, hold on. There's just so many straw man labor theories of value that yeah, pretty much everybody who adheres to one of them rejects all of the other ones. Yeah, and those are all the real ones according to the people that are opposed to it. So, but well, just... remember, remember Kropotkin's argument from the first couple of chapters. He explicitly says that it does doesn't matter so much as um it's all about since i like ideas and people the you're always going to be working off the people before you and you can never give them that value back everyone should have everything all for all oh so right? it's like the opposite of the boomer trolley problem okay. yeah okay boomer that's a slur <laughs> <laughs> okay boomer but yeah so let me look at my notes you say let me look at my knife my no, notes, his notes. Christ Almighty. Cannot save this podcast. This is off to an amazing start. Congratulations, guys. Speaking of, uh, I am Fei Long, and I am joined here with Confite, Zulikath, and Cardin. Hello. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hello. Uh, we've already kind of said hi. That's fine. <laughs> ah, fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. We're good. I think my computer just fucking froze. That this is, is hilarious. This is the most amazing episode of this podcast that will ever exist. Anyways, since we're kind of waiting, let me actually... Let me actually talk to you about about this uh, fucking Marx's refusal of the labor theory of value by one David Harvey. It is widely believed that Marx adapted the labor theory of value from Ricardo, but on the few occasions when Marx commit, comments directly on this matter, matter he, refu- he refers to value theory and not to labor theory of value. And it's like fucking, he literally like cites the chapters on on a uh, labor on Marx's capital. Yeah, David Harvey is good stuff as far as like uh, he has a whole tutorial series on YouTube reading people through capital. Okay, I I see I kind of see where he's coming from now. That's interesting. See, this might be actually a good uh thing to. Oh, never mind. Yeah, but um, so going back to uh ways and means, kind of going back to our actual podcast. Yeah. So what he's talking about here is. I'm a little bit confused. This, this chapter isn't what I remember the least. I read this like a while ago. I read the other ones like two days ago. So yeah. Well, so the first part of it is basically about how you can't expect capitalism to improve society because that's expecting a capitalist to do things that the system doesn't incentivize capitalists to do. Mm. Yeah. And that's basically what it's about. He actually even talks about how if you work in a factory, it is kind of a necessity of the worker to not give their all. Because if they give the all, yeah, they were basically losing. Later. Yeah. Bad work for bad pay. Yeah. It, it, the boss may, I make a quarter, boss makes a dime. That's why I jerk off on company time. <laughs> okay, I heard my version is poop, but you know, you do uh, you, you and gotta be your hand. Um, <laughs> modern problems require modern solutions. But there's, a, there's actually a whole kind of spiel I've had on that one for quite a while. And it's basically... That when the workplace has that one guy who gives like extra to the company, the boss learns, he immediately starts to expect that, feel entitled to it, and then demand it of everyone yeah. without raising their compensation for the extra um, labor. And that's kind of why there's always that guy at the workplace, you know, the one who practically works as a volunteer. And well, he makes everybody else's lives miserable by, well, by literally raising the standard for nothing. But it's kind of like that clown meme where it's like, you know, if I give my all and I don't call out on sick days or take it using my PTO, then, oh, obviously the the, the, the boss will, will recognize, recognize me. me. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, even even like, I even see this in my current job, like as a lead, because I'm supposed to be like the go-between the go between for both the worker and the supervisor and i even see this and i'm like guys do not rush yourselves because they will expect that like right now we're we're, we're operating going above the at, standard does not make you go above the standard it just raises the standard everybody else has to work it, me- it yeah. means that you're giving more surplus value and your boss is going to expect that more surplus value and the whole point is that what you really want to do is give them exactly what they're paying you to do that's yeah. why that's but they'll why. be really pissed off at you if you do that. But another way they've well, they're gonna be pissed to... off at you anyways because their whole thing is just they want as much surplus value as they can get. Yeah. And so if you don't give them 
um, they're always going to want more. That's why capitalism consumes. It's they always want more and more and more value because so that they can uh, just make more money, and that's the same thing. So that margins can be higher, and you can make shitloads more money. Yeah, yeah because... their class interests are just simply opposed to yours. That's just how it works. And mm -hmm. it gets even more interesting because they actually have a strategy of making sure that in some in more some workplaces they use metrics to. Well, they they put a fucking scoreboard board in the middle of the workplace, and suddenly, the office or factory is PVP in terms of work performance and shit. Even Kobotkin's like direct words on this is the evil lies in the possibility of surplus value existing. It is it is a case of producing the greatest amount of goods necessary to the well being of all with the least amount of waste of human energy. Mm -hmm. He he basically even he's basically looking at capitalism going like, listen, if, if we were to do the exact same thing without the necessity of the capitalist extracting the surplus value, without the possibility of surplus value existing then we could do so much better. He even says, thus it would be suffi it would suffice for a man to work under the same conditions for 30 hours, say six, six half days of five hours each, to have bread for a whole year. Now, mind you, this is also back where they were working, what, 10-hour work days before the unions work, uh, pushed down to mm. eight. Like, this is also the thing where it's like, when you look at, um, this is the bane of, like, neoliberalism and kind of basically uh, this whole chapter really destroys that whole theory even before it's even born because it's the idea that um since the neoliberal turn in the world in the 80s prices have or wages have stagnated across the full board wages have stagnated but for, but productivity but productivity has gone through the fucking roof exactly for some and, and so and you and when you're just being expect this now yeah and when you're being the underpaid turn. beforehand even like even before you were being kind of underpaid now it's even more so because productivity is through the roof, because we have so much better technology. But all that wealth is going straight to the top. That wealth just doesn't disappear. It, it goes to the top. It concentrates And itself. so that... And it, well, it kind of disappears because it just becomes a high score for some people where it could become bread for others. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of like, like how recently, to kind of comment on um, modern events, which, oh my god, I can't believe we're doing that on a podcast about philosophy, um, where Bernie is talking about, you know, taxing taxing Bill Gates at like a taxing like a hundred billion out of his income and Bill Gates tweets like oh my gosh I'd have to start doing calculations and it's like you'd still have six billion left over if we taxed you at a hundred billion like that's still way more than anybody could ever need in their fucking lives I mean it's like that button that you press it everybody in the world gets fed but you know some rich people lose some of their money that's li that's literally it like we'll we have the thing. capacity to like end world like every everyone talks about like you know charity and this is why I, charity is fundamentally a broken idea that you know you're not these people at the top they're gonna only give a pittance of their money to people who desperately need it and so charity just isn't working because we can solve all the world's we can solve most of the world's problems when it comes to just like hunger or f drinking water or whatnot right now this instant if those people decided to give up their money but they won't and that's the problem well yeah because the whole as soon as you do that you go under because w w basically you can't just throw that out there well because the capitalist class cannot exist de facto when they're throwing out all their surplus value value that they're extracting exactly yeah. you, you you would destroy the class that you would too. flatten hierarchy and in a system that and in incentivizes um well greed then it becomes a actually genuinely bad move to act philanthropically what was that recent movement where it's like where it's like Elon Musk was um, had donated something like a thousand dollars or like ten thousand dollars to a uh, trees thing, and it's like he, he pretty much like if we had donated if you had made a thousand dollars a month and donated a single penny, you'd still be donating more of your income percentage wise than Elon Musk just did. But that's that's the thing. People don't look at the percentages. They like to say, "Wow, look at this large sum of money," but it's a, a drop in the bucket if you consider percentage wise. How much they're keeping and like how much that money like where does that money money exactly go who what are they doing with that money and where is it they're either going to buy hugely extravagant things lots of cocaine or it's just going to sit in there on a cayman island account well it doesn't actually sit in the cayman island account they reinvest it in other capital to 
to, to perpetuate the cycle. Well, yeah, they, well, they, they either reinvest it in uh, non-liquid assets. So yeah, they, they reinvest it in fucking stock buybacks. Basically, they can That's hide what, they what money they do have. Or they invest it in IPOs that just fail. Yeah. Because they have nothing else to do with their money. Well, where does the money that goes into the IPOs that fail go? To the, uh, to the other people's pockets, making more billionaires. It goes in the same place. It just moves around. Like, it, that's not the major concern, is uh, billionaires investing in IPOs that end up tanking. Nobody really cares, because it's just yeah. money moving around between rich people it doesn't really affect anybody else. Well, it exactly. affects, you know, the lives of people here on Earth by its absence, or well, more specifically, by the absence of uh, means. Right. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm just saying that, like, the problem with the billionaires isn't that they're investing in things that fail. The problem is that they're taking money from other people, like ordinary people, and not from each other. Like, if billionaires are stealing from billionaires, nobody cares. I, th I think one of the things, the, the modern problem. day version of kind of what Prokofakis talking about in this chapter is there was a study done, or this wasn't even a study, I think this was just someone doing math on fucking Twitter or whatnot, where they were saying that, so, if everyone who worked at McDonald's got paid the same... And um, all the all their labor and their money went about the same thing. You don't have to work for like two hours a week in order to make like all your money for the year that you would normally make in a year working at McDonald's. Uh, That's how much surplus thing value about McDonald's there is. is. If we established UBI, that company would go out of business in a week just due to the massive uh, walk-offs. People would take one day of the uh, bullshit and realize, like, no, I don't really have to uh, come to this motherfucker anymore. Well, I mean, if you just have UBI, the problem with uh, UBI is that your rent's going to go up, so it's, you're still going to have to work that shitty job. Yeah, that's the big issue, is you can't just do UBI on its own and expect that to work, because right now the value and price of things is totally arbitrary and people will see oh everybody's got a little bit more in their pockets so we'll just charge a little more well exactly i think you get inflation that way so we'd have to go back to the gold standard the gold standard yeah okay thanks william jennings bryant fucking shit basically um the idea is either the amount you get for ubi has to keep up with the uh rates that people are increasing prices for in which case you get a fun little Game of cat and mouse with inflation, or, or here, well, here's here's the better idea. You regulate You prices. do UBI in, in in the way of like welfare programs, like where you have you know fucking uh, food stamps. You do things like that, where like this because the landlords cannot take your fucking food stamps for rent, and it's not going to be like extra capital in your pocket that anyone knows you have, but you still have more money in your pocket, quote unquote. Because you're saving money elsewhere and you're doing other things. So you're still getting a stipend and you're still allowed to live, but a lot of that capital cannot be taken out, you know, so easily as just simply your landlord increasing it by $200 and being like, ha ha ha, whatever. Ah, uh, right. It can't be extracted from you as easily. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a little more secure that way. I like it. Yeah, that, that's that's the better version of UBI. Like, as cool as $1,000 a month sounds. Well, I mean, it's basically an expansion of that is what it is. I mean, that with also the guarantee of housing. I'm sorry, when I say UBI, I kind of uh, lump those two things together. Mm -hmm. How so? Uh, UBI with uh, free housing. Wait, are we talking like, hey, all housing is free, we abolished private property, and there's no more landlords? Or are we talking like, hey, the, the government is providing... Landlords just have a guaranteed income now. No, like a guaranteed dwelling and income, like as covered in chapters 6 and 7, really. Well, mostly... Well, yeah, what he's, what he's talking about is basically the abolishment, not of, not of private property in that sense, where it's the abolishment... It's the ability where you have, a, you have public housing, right? Pretty much. Yeah, right. yeah. Public ho it's public housing, in a sense. But then you have the fucking gripe of, oh, well, no, then everybody would just be in an apartment because you just have brutalist apartment complexes sprouting up across the... Yeah, but we already have that here under capitalism, so it's like not even an argument. Exactly. I think that chapter comes later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that too. Yeah, he, do he does go into kind of um, the criticism of like, the really bad faith, like, well, under socialism everyone's equally poor! Ha! <laughs> he, go he goes into that later. Okay, Boomer. Yeah, it's literally that. <laughs> it's like, that is the chapter of Okay, Boomer. Yeah. <laughs> But that, that's that's later on. I mean, yeah. What chapter it, are we on now? Eight. Eight. We're still on ways and means, and it's kind of like, 
I, I think the main issue with it is it's pretty much just he's sitting here and he's trying to break down uh, mathematically how much we'd ha- you would have to devote to the the socially ob- the social obligations of work, right? The the creating of yarn, the growing of food, the basically making sure that everybody is taken care of, and how people would have to work um, in their um, in he their socially a dig obligated out America, labor. Which was amusing. What? He took a dig at America, which was kind of amusing to me. Well, kinda. I mean, at least maybe not even back then, but. At least well, he kinda, modern day. He kind of talks about America was pretty different back then. It was mostly a farming country still. Well, I mean, yeah, cause this, uh, is li- this is late 1800s. It, it wasn't the industrial powerhouse that it was today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is late 1800s, like, like you said. Yeah. Like, That's, I, this is like 20 years after the Civil War ended, kind of stuff. Well, I, I think he's mostly like, he was making a jab. He, he does make a jab at the United States. He actually speci- explicitly points at the United States, as well as London and Belgium, but. I think he's talking mostly about like the the slave labor that they utilize because in thus in the United States seven hundred and fifty one cotton mills one thousand seven hundred one hundred and seventy five thousand men and women produced two two billion thirty three million yards of cotton goods besides a great cotton co- quantity of thread and he's like, well, we don't actually need that much that's just overprodu- overproduction of what the need is, so we have all this fucking surplus all the fucking time. So if we actually just focused on what people needed, then we wouldn't have to worry about any of this because it would just be, oh, we, we would just need 50 hours of work uh, a, a year. I believe that was also a point being made in the context of explaining uh, like why the capitalist is taking so much of the extra and making us work so much more and not so much about the waste of all the extra production. Mm-hmm. I don't think that was you really know, it a wasn't part necessarily of that over. Yeah, exactly. It was not an overproduction. It goes back to the McDonald's example where it's like, if everyone got what they deserved and got all the value that they produced and there was no surplus value being siphoned off at the top, they would be able to just, like, work a pit. Well, the burger would actually be very expensive under that situation if everybody... Like, our organization of work under capitalism is so inefficient that the end product that is made is literally worth less than all the labor that was put into it. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. So you're saying that we're making mud pies. Oh, Dennis, there's some lovely filth over here! Oh, God. Oh, my God. Yeah. They, are, they, are, they do actually say they're in an arco-syndicalist uh, commune in that. Yep, it did. And, and it's actually, actually kind of as a side note, I noticed that I, I do think Kropotkin is more of an anarcho-syndicalist than he is an anarcho-communist. But like, uh, because he does talk about syndicalism. Yeah, he talks but about kind of coming in, um, I believe, chapter ten, which we'll get to. Yeah, but he does talk like it's actually really funny because th- thinking about like <laughs> if if we're thinking about modern day um, working conditions, he's talking he's talking about thirteen to fourteen hours a day and fifty five hours a week, and I'm like, holy shit, that is a shit ton of work that has to be done just to provide for yarn. It's not entirely dissimilar to 21st century proletarians. No, and, and that's and he's talking more like the United States that teaches I mean the modern proletarians, sorry, like today's proletarians. Yeah. And and, and that's what they're what they I'm were not working. A time that's what the what they were working back then and then he goes on and says, "Well, if we actually talk about how much people need and we're not we're not we're getting rid of the surplus value, you only need 17 exactly. hours of work." A year. Well, that's what he's saying. It's like it's like with this one. He just wants to kind of um, make it so that people work for what you need, and then afterwards you can relax and do what you want. And then he goes into the, the segues into the next chapter, mm-hmm. the luxuries chapter. Yeah, which is about art and shit. Well, he, he he's kind of yeah. I think in this in the need for luxury, he's talking more about you know what do people do when all the needs are met. Um, and it kind of goes into the whole where he was talking about the in chapter six, uh, five, six, and seven on how you know if if, if everybody's needs are met, they'd still want to do stuff. It, he the the first thing that I noticed here was if we wish to for a social revolution, it is no doubt first of all to give bread to everyone to transfer this exer- exerable society in which we can every day see capable workmen dangling their arms for want of an employer who would exploit them. 
Men and women and children wandering shelterless at night, whole families reduced to dry bread, men, women, and children dying for want of care and even for want of food. It is to put an end to in these inequities that we rebel. And this is this ch entire chapter goes on about how, well, yeah, the needs are the food, the shelter, and the clothing. It's not everybody wants a telescope. It's not that everybody wants, you know, the the giant labs like <laughs> mm -hmm. we're not looking to provide equality of outcome yeah we're just looking to provide equality of opportunity well i mean absolutely equality is like kind of ridiculous because different people inherently want different things mm -hmm. well that's what he kind of and may work towards them i mean this is a part of the society where a market could uh realistically exist without disturbing too much uh that balance. Mm -hmm. Well, I think almost like going into kind of um, shifting into the next factor, I think the next chapter, uh, chapter 9, talking about luxuries, really encompasses why the furry community is kind of anarchist, in a, has certain anarchist elements that are really, really helpful for understanding how anarchism can work in a modern 21st century society. Like, the also Kropotkin's got a hard on for science. Yeah, he does. I mean, he he talks a lot about uh science and scientific endeavors. There's a couple things I think that I disagreed with him on that, but the need for luxury I think is probably one of my favorite chapters in the book after reading it because I didn't realize it was interesting. Um, it's also one of the longest ones. Yeah, it is one of the longest ones. But he makes an argument. Jokingly, the rest that, of the book. Yeah. So he, so Kropotkin kind of goes away from the average thing where it's like, oh man, everyone's just going to be working in these dull gray sheds and it's going to be like, uh, the stick. Like capitalism is today. Yeah. But it's going to be like, but worse because everyone's just going to work and there's going to be no, no, nothing else to do. There's going to be no luxuries or anything down. And he's like, well, no, the whole point is that you're going to have more time to do luxury work and you're going to have more time to do all these different things because you're going to not have to, you know, sit around and uh make surplus labor so that someone else can have luxuries and that's what he's talking about and he's talking about also just he makes a really good criticism of culture which is to say that culture does not come from the top down it comes from the bottom up yeah you see this with like any sort of um hip-hop in the african-american community especially you know do you think rap would ever come around from fucking corporate people at the top no like that that came up from up from the bottom it was a thing that the people at the bottom stuff. You could say it came up from the depths. Yeah. 30 stories high. I, I haven't read it, but I believe that uh, Rudolf Rocker makes the same point in a, a book, Nationalism and Culture. Mm. Hmm. Did you guys watch that uh, ContraPoint video on a, a... No. What was it? Uh, the most recent one where she's basically talking about how the, the gay community, at least specifically the black gay community, is the, one, is the ones where a lot of our modern slang is actually evolved from. Because it's oh, from is that them. the one where she has that true scum on? Uh, I guess so. Then no. I have not seen it. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it. I think that that's our point, is that capitalism doesn't produce culture. If I can, when we talk about... It the, kills it. When people say there is no white culture, we don't mean, like, there, there, is, there is in a sense because of, like, you know, underclass sort of, like... Like, I would consider, like, some types, certain types of, like, Appalachian culture and sort of, like you know, uh, old coal miners and people doing things like uh, that and sort of their own culture. You can have culture regardless of your race. The point is, is that people at the top don't have culture. They only seek to basically, you know, again, it, they, they seek to make money. And the culture they produce is going to be bland and monotone because they're not going to take risks on things. They don't need to. Well they sh it's not it's that, bad for the profit also, incentive not only that but also to kind of quote from uh, mark fisher um capitalism basically you sub subjugates culture in a means to make more money mm -hmm. like the he my favorite quote by him is about how nirvana utilizing mtv was trying to subvert the culture of the modern music industry but they ultimately knew that ultimately it would be, oh, I my my entire 
my entire rebellion is going to be utilized as a means to make money. And lo and behold, Apple does exactly that. Well, I think also just at the same time, there was a really good article I wrote, I read on, on Medium of all places um, about kind of left tube and how we should uh, kind of ideal idolizing people is bad especially because we know that a lot of these people are are making these like like for instance we all love contra we love contra points we love we love ollie uh, for philosophy too. I, I love i love her i don't know i don't know about you but um i think the biggest thing that he was talking about he was like look at the end of the day we know that they are do they are ultimately doing this in a sense, for some monetary gain, they might love what they do, and they might have, they might, um, they might wish that it wasn't that way, where they can just kind of make these good critiques and not act- actually have to get money. But you have to get money in order to live. So ultimately, that's the end goal of like everything under capitalism is to make the most money ever, and that's the reason why it sucks because it's like you're never going to get good culture from that. You're never going to get like actual risks and stuff because because culture comes from people thinking about the system and subverting it rather than coming from just maintaining the status quo well in thinking about it like kind of kind of returning to the non sequitur i do think that there is a culture at the top but it's not a culture that we would recognize as culture so to speak mm. because it's more of a toxic conglomeration of stuff well n- not only that but like their culture seems to be like spending millions of dollars on hotels fly jet setting across the globe on their jets and just buying I- exorbitant items because well wh- what else are we going to do with our billions and billions of dollars well i think that there's a mistake well the culture is of hoard it's like dragons really that that's all they do is they they're too busy sitting on their piles of hoarded gold to engage in any kind of real meaningful human interaction or culture well there's hashtag not all dragons yeah, but um yeah i'm just an introvert don't let don't me in that yeah <laughs> all right i forgot you're one of the you're a dragons but like one not not like a worm or anything yeah i'm one of them yeah so i think there's a miscommunication here when I was talking about culture, I was not meaning the idea that they have certain um, actions that they take at the top, which defines them as a group of people. I mean culture in the sense of um, artistic expressions of ev- of you know artistic expressions of themselves, which seek to under to reach some higher understanding. So, for instance, like. If you talk about like rap or something like that, the idea is for the most is the idea is that culture comes from uh oh fuck I just lost my train of thought but we, okay it, it doesn't come from like super creative genius that's been going through college for eight years and learning all the artistic stuff the high no, that's stuff. not culture that's it's the regurgitation yeah, yeah. mm-hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, a lot yeah. of culture is recycled intellectually. Well, it's, it's and that's not bad. It's no, remixed, it's which is which is different than just recycled. Capitalism. Yeah, like, like, there's that's true. Recreation that's as opposed to recitation. Yes. Yep. And I think my 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 point was that I tried to make, but I had a brain fart. Was that you know when you look at the culture surrounding like rap, it's going to be all about you know the hustle and whatnot, and that reflects the average life of you know an african-american in in this country where you have to like you know make sure that you live in like a you're a one-parent household you have to like look after your kids and have to be the progenitor of the household uh, because your your father's not around or whatnot and that sort of thing it reflects a broader um historical moment rather than simply uh we were talking about with like capitalist culture that doesn't represent like a broader historical moment that just represents uh what people in a certain class do if that makes any sense more or less 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of. Because I think I think I think like like that's that's a distinction for me between like because like anything can have you can have a culture quote unquote of of anything. You can have like toxic cultures and talk to- culture of capitalism and whatnot. But what am we talking about culture in a broad sense? I mean, I've seen the culture of capitalism and it's kind of culty. Not gonna lie. Yeah. Well, in, in but what we mean in a broad broad sense is just the idea of um how people express themselves in a society and how their trials and tribulations and their successes are expressed and what exactly are those and how do they express them that is culture rich people generally don't have many trials or tribulations they have to express so they're not going to express a whole lot so that yeah and and section two of chapter nine is mostly about this too it's about how people like when you get the uh, the, the people who plow the fields when we're fed. Yeah, once you get once people are fed, uh, they spend their like four or five hours a day trying to feed themselves, house themselves, close themselves. After that, they get the other like five hours of uh, what would be work day to do uh, luxury things, and it's about how people who would otherwise be digging ditches and plowing fields and working in factories can uh, pursue arts and do it make their own reproducing and reflecting their actual experiences the actual hardships that they have in their life and it's something that like you were saying that in the upper classes they don't really have these experiences so they can only kind of imitate them and it feels hollow exactly oh but guys you gotta you gotta think the the number one it's uh, still kind of gatekeeper the number one problem that billions er billions of errors have to overcome is dyslexia in illiteracy. What? Where did you fucking hear that? Wait, what? So I, I listen. No, seriously. So I listen to this podcast. Um, that's basically like they they basically grab a billionaire every week and they do a um, do like a well, this is what this is how they got their money. This is what who they are. And oh, like is this Grubs Takers? Yeah, yeah. The one that you were like. I'm yeah. actually about to go and on basi- there, but anyway. Wait, this is what? And basically, they they base they're basically saying that like nine out of ten billionaires claim that they had dyslexia growing up or they were illiterate growing up and it's just like they're basically utilizing this thing that you can't really like you can't really prove one way or the other God, you can just kind of claim it but they're utilizing it as a means to be like oh well i'm i i've had my trials and tribulations i had things i had overcome right so it's bone spurs yeah oh so i see what you're saying it's it's the idea of uh Oh yeah, yeah. So they're 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 trying to say that they. My life as a billionaire was hard too. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, I had to struggle too when the. Well, I mean, everybody does stub their toe, but that's very different. Yeah, exactly. So I I I I agree with that. I thought you were saying that like legitimately, fucking dyslexia was a problem for billionaires or something like that. <laughs> no. No. Like they just tend to be uneducated because they don't need a foundation in order to survive. Because let's be real. Or they just, or they, or their parents just donate millions of dollars to Harvard just so they can get in. I want to know how many billionaires think that they are self-made billionaires. Oh, Literally all of them. Pretty much, yeah. Well, yeah, like ninety percent, and about eighty percent of them basically inherited all their millions. Well, going going back to Grubs Takers, the thing that they make fun of all the time is the fucking Forbes uh, billionaire self-made score, where because it's just bullshit. It doesn't. It, there is there is no such thing as a self-made billionaire. Either they're going to be aping off of the infrastructure that the government has created, or they're aping off the money their parents have. Who have aped off of... Or if they won the lottery that one time. Well, no, usually those people don't end up being billionaires. Usually those people end up being broke. Yeah. Billionaires know how to do one thing, even halfway decently, and that's reinvesting their money so that they get more money. And that's literally their only... They probably hire somebody else to do that for them. I would say usually how they do it is, like, through stock buybacks, which is not reinvesting. That's basically just saying that you go, you are inflating the price of your commodity or whatever you're doing artificially. I don't think it actually does that. Like when you look at all the total effects of a stock buyback, I don't think that's the actual effect that it has. In the short term, in the long term, no. um, I do. Like it, it, in, it increases, it keeps the value of the company that they're buying and selling shares of constant. 
but when they buy back the shares, there's fewer shares, so each share is worth more. That that's what's going on there. Well, like I said, it's it's literally just a, a hot potato game. They're 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 betting that they can either sell off the company or give it to some other schmuck that uh, will have it at that time at an inflated price, and then it crashes down later, and they don't they don't have it on their hands. So what do they care? That's the bet. I do know a pump of a pump and dump kind of thing that they do, where they will. Uh, like sacrifice the long-term viability of a company to get the uh, profits in the short term looking good. I feel like yeah. that's and a metaphor for something that, that increases else. the valuation and then they sell it. But then they're just, I mean, it's like I was saying, billionaires stealing from billionaires. Mm -hmm. That's not the worst thing in the world uh, unless it's causing, you know, the companies people are relying on for their jobs to go away. Well, and that's, that's necessarily what happens with pump and dumps is people, like thousands of people end up losing their jobs and companies go under. Yeah. Well, the biggest thing is that also with um, the rise of the 401k and people being like, oh, instead of having, you know, government accounts, what you can do is just use your 401k. The issue with that is that all, the, all these 401ks are tied to all these companies. So if you have a company that fucking goes under or if you had the 2008 financial cri crisis, you lose all your money. And meanwhile, all that money that's already invested there is already long gone in this some Cayman Island account. But returning to Kropotkin, like he, he's, he, this entire chapter, the need for luxury, like it, most of it is pretty much him just going on about how, well, if we, if we give everybody everything they need, they will create culture because so many people already, like even in the capitalist sense, capitalist culture, sit down and go, hey. I'm going to devote my time and energy to something with, free, free of charge, so to speak. Well, um, like, like what we're doing with this podcast, we're operating at a loss, but we still love to do it. I mean, that's why I am passionate about this because this is just something I yeah. think is important. Yeah, so I should prove it right there. Yeah, and that that directly goes against the whole. Well, if you give everybody everything they need, they're just people are just going to lay around. Well, no, no, people are going to still work. In fact, the, the whole point yeah, I is mean, that... we have so many organizations that, you know, basically put lies to that claim. It's not even funny. It's just like, it can be so quickly dismissed. It's so stupid. I mean, it's not like there's something wrong with, like, having more uh, free time either. I mean, if we're overworked all the time, that's part of what uh, Chapter 8 is about, is how overworked we are. Mm -hmm. So if we have more time to... Uh, yeah, it's... Sorry, distraction. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, if we have more time to ourselves, then we can do more luxury, have more leisure, pursue more interest. That's a good thing. Yeah, live life more. He will to employ the, fourth. the second half of his second half of his day, his week or year, to satisfy his artistic or scientific needs or his hobbies. Thousands of societies will spring up to gratify every taste and every possible fancy. Exactly, and I think that uh, this is one thing Kropotkin kind of gets that a lot of other kind of socialists don't get. He understands that you. Um, there is a need. There is an insatiable need for art in people's lives. It is not just um, that people go on to go to work and make money and then go home and they all do nothing if they have all the things that they need. No, people make art because they're passionate about it. And like I said, this draws back to the furry community. A lot of people in this community, it's generally lower class people who are working uh, minimum wage jobs. Like I know so many people who. Um, want to do art for like a living or want would love to do art and stuff for like a living and they're really good but they can't because they it, there's just no money in it but they still do it even if it pays me yeah, it is the kind of labor that you can really love like we don't just want to be around art we want to uh produce art we want to express ourselves and that's one of the things that we can do with all the extra leisure or luxury time that we have yeah. when a man will have something useful to say a word that goes beyond the thoughts of a century he will not have to look for an editor who might invent the necessary capital. Because everything is taken care of, you're able to just invest where you want. Together they will publish the new book or journal. Literature and journalism will cease to be a means of money making and living at the cost of others. Yeah, and this guy is, did definitely not see the internet coming. Well, he kind of talks about that, where it's like so, there's a lot of societies and he, he the saw need for fandoms coming. Well, yeah, the need like, for he information. He really saw. Like Tumblr pre-2019, he saw that coming somehow. Well, he didn't see the porn crisis of Tumblr 2019. <laughs> yeah, it was like I said, Tumblr before 2019, before the porn crisis. But I think that kind of gets down to the point where Kropotkin's trying to say that people in and of themselves need... It's almost like a metaphysical argument where people have a need to, you know 
produce culture and uh, they feel like they want to do what drives them and makes them passionate and what they love. And so after you work, the ideal system would be after you work, you know, the stuff that you have to do to make sure that everyone, st everyone stays healthy, you go and do whatever you want. And that's ideally what a lot of people like to say capitalism is, but that's not what it is. Well, it most certainly ain't. Yeah. It is for them. It isn't for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is for the defenders of it, mm -hmm. usually. Well, I get all this luxury time based on other people doing the work that I don't have to do now. Well, yeah. I just go to the store and there's you, food there, and it's great. I, an, another, I'm just going to not name names here. Well, yeah, but that's the, that's the bourgeois class. That's everybody who's making, you know, six, seven figures a year. No, no big deal. Because when you're making that much money, yeah, you can afford to have the luxury. Yeah, you may have worked, you may have worked your ass off to get to there. Because I, I think nowadays there's there's even, there's actual self-made millionaires, and that's a millionaire with what? with an M, not a billionaire uh, with a B. Yeah, kinda. millionaire with an M. Maybe. Well, <laughs> I'm sure a bunch of doctors and some maybe some celebrities or sports players. That's about yeah. it. Yeah, it's yeah, mostly doctors. Like, I, there's there's some engineers that are like that too. It but it's like it's a specialized. There's a few specialized fields where that happens. Yeah, yeah. But it, but it's like these these kind of bourgeois mechanisms are the only p places that you actually see this kind of luxury where people can, you know, spend ninety percent of their days doing nothing. And that's a big thing is like okay, so under capitalism, how much you get paid is inversely proportional to how hard you work but it also i think gets at some stuff from chapter eight if i can remind it, if i find my notes on it oh uh, yes well-being under capitalism being more transitory instead of uh, guaranteed and they'll always hold up here's a few workers uh, under capitalism made it really well in their lives and it was like yeah for about you know five minutes and then they fell down the hole just the same as the rest of us because it's designed to fucking do that yeah i think he was talking about like industries that spring up for a short time and then like the uh the tulip crisis tulip mania mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, just st i thought he was talking about like individual workers who sometimes actually manage to profit i don't think that's what he meant i think that was like that might i can see why you get that out of it then. but i don't think that's yeah. what the intent was I think it's more like, hey, for the next uh, like twenty years, there's going to be a build in or a boom in uh, construction, and then uh, the banks that are financing all of it are going to just kind of like, yeah, but there's, there's no money in this anymore, and then all the construction stops, and all the construction workers don't have jobs anymore. I think that's what he meant. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, yeah, it's exactly where it incentivizes whatever is going to make the most money rather than what the people actually need. We've already seen this happen. Like we said before, the incentive is to make shitloads of money. And so that's why you have hunger. Blame cap it's, Capitalism is the number one reason why you have hunger, why you have all these disease and stuff like that. I, I hate to be that guy who's just like, oh, if we only didn't have capitalism, we'd be living on Mars right now. But there is but some truth to that. But if only we didn't have capitalism, we'd be living on Mars right now. I mean, there, there is some truth to that. Or maybe we'd There is some truth theories. that a lot of the problems that we have here are because of the fact that um, of that capitalism exists. And that's that's plain and simple. I think a lot of people don't want to realize that. Because you can draw these things back, and there's plenty of micro issues where, uh, just within the certain neoliberal sense of what capitalism we have now, uh, that are specific to neoliberal capitalism as opposed to like mercantilism or um, older forms of capitalism. But in the end, a lot of our problems just boil down to it, it's capitalism, it's plain and simple. Well, yeah. I, w I will say that that's kind of a reduction because it's not. It is a reductionist. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. It is it's not necessarily. It's not necessarily capitalism with a bit with a big C. It's this idea of people extracting the surplus labor, unions not being able to effectively union uh, unionize. It's this idea of people ha constantly being worked, overworked and underpaid and have have their surplus value extracted when all they really do need to do is work you know that 17 hours a year um which it's gonna it's really interesting to see where he gets that figure and how that figures out in a more contemporary setting well, yeah it, if, we're, if we're being honest kropotkin's figures of how long people would need to work in a year should would nowadays be a lot less considering of 
considering our t- automation cap- capacity. I mean, to produce a surplus of supplies and not a surplus value, you know, 24 hours a year would probably quite nicely suffice. And and what was what was that figure that was kind of floating around like a couple months ago about how uh, the serfs under feudalism actually worked a hell of a lot less than modern industrial countries it was like something like there were they only had to work like something like five hours a week or something crazy like that to support themselves oh wow yeah i mean they probably couldn't do a whole lot of work for most of the winter so that's probably averaged out over the course of the year that's true that is also during harvest season i bet they were working 14 hour days but like okay you, you plant you work a lot you harvest you work a lot it's not a whole lot to do in the summer compared to that and during the winter you're you can't work. It's too cold out. Yeah, it's really oddly kind of opposite, though, if, you're, if you live in a city, though, because it's like, oh, you don't have to do jack shit during the uh, summer unless you're part of the construction crews. And under communism, you probably will be. But during the winter, you have to plow the snow. Well, th- this was during the um, feudal era, not today. Today, it's different. Yeah, yeah no, it's, today it's like weirdly flipped, except for, yeah. Only when it snows. I don't even think like every surf would actually be, you know, plowing the fields because you still had the the majority of serfs owned their own property. Like yeah, they may have a feudal lord that they had to pay taxes to, but they still technically owned their property. They didn't have to pay some bank of mortgage every month so that they could live there. They didn't have to pay rent to their to some landlord so that they could live there. I believe they did. I believe they they paid part of their harvest is usually how that worked as I understand mm-hmm. it. Mm, yep. Yeah. But so like they would uh, they have some fuel that they could use to grow some of their food, but however much they grow, the Lord gets a third of it, and it'd be something like that. That's not the worst of these systems I've ever heard of. I mean, it's not. Although there is the, the tax rate is about what we have today. Yeah. It was just a private, well, quasi private. What do you even call that? Under feudalism, it's not. It's not private. Gaining something for. You know, just by having something. It was privatized later, anyway. But like that, what you're paying in rent is still like what we have in taxes today in first world countries, as far as percentage. Yeah. yeah. But it's not even. I don't. I don't think privatization actually came until the the acts of enclosure. In yeah. The, in the the early 1800s. Yeah, it was not the acts of enclosure, but also afterwards, um, you see a lot of the term privatization comes about after Nazi Germany, but the, the practice has come before that. And the enclosure movement is kind of like that. I'm not too familiar with that one actually. Well, so the enclosure acts were basically like, uh. I think it started first in France, question mark? I think it was Britain. Mm. Yeah, maybe Britain. But it was basically like where you had all these feudal lords, they were they were given the, the power by the state to sit down and go, yeah, so all of this land that you claim is yours, you can actually build a fence or, or a wall around it and stop people from... It was basically out. common, like, grazing land. It, so it like, was, if you think yeah. about, like... Oh. An, Enclosure of the commons yeah. is what it yeah. was. So th- there was a commons that anybody could go out and... Uh, well, not anybody, but basically the people in the community could go out and plow it and use it to grow their food. And then it, it started getting sold off in blocks uh, for individual landlords. Which actually, basically. speaking of the, the commons, did you guys hear that apparently, I actually heard this from somebody, I didn't find any like actual articles, so, concrete articles, but like apparently the person that coined the idea of the tragedy of the commons went back and was like yeah this actually doesn't happen yeah yeah he, he yeah i've heard that i've heard that as well um, i i think it was a tragedy of the unmanaged commons because a managed commons didn't have that problem oh right the idea that most of the actual commons that existed historically were managed by the community communities mm-hmm. without cops will just fall in on themselves and chaos and destruction and all that shit the the boogeyman state is version of anarchy oh yes well so so for those who don't know the tragedy of the commons is basically a thought experiment that basically says if everybody is a- has access to common land like the, the the specific thing is like well you have a field and you have three or four farmers that have livestock um if it's if it's unmanaged then you know one farmer or a couple farmers just have their have their livestock graze that land until it becomes fallow mm-hmm. and the, the tragedy of the commons basically it, it expands from this and says, well, if you have any kind of commons, people are just going to use it without regard for the future 
future generations or other people's use. And the well, the, the person who does that may find themselves in exile because that really is anarchism's best and almost only tool against abuse is. That kind of thing. That. It's up. There's multiple yeah. tools, but yeah. the best one um, is. It, to, it, yeah. The, the basic idea, though, is that if you have a free resource, people don't have to pay for it and aren't responsible for it. They will burn it up and throw it away. And in, in actual practice, where these commons existed, that wasn't what happened because there was community management of those things. I mean, this sort of thing does happen under capitalism, as evidenced by. Uh, the entire fucking planet Earth. Well, yeah, it's 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 the yeah. idea, like like it's this mentality that a lot of capitalists have. They can't get out of, and it's the reason for what a lot of um, you know, the, this thinking about or a lot of bad faith arguments about socialism. It's just you can't get out of this thinking of everything's a competition. We are all competitors. Everything is all about the more competition it is, the better. And like thinking of it rather in terms of class struggle, thinking about it in terms of just individual interpersonal struggle is what drives the world. And that's just not true. Like it's really weird to try and get these kinds of people to just try and imagine what we could accomplish if we, you know, freely cooperated. Because you're just trying to lie to them and stop them from getting the highest score before they die. Ah, oh, right, yes. I forgot. Yeah. That was one of that was one of capitalist's greatest feats was convincing people that, well, we are all individuals and that's all we need to act upon is just our individualization, and our atomization of the self. So any kind of cooperation is bad because you're not competing, and if you if you cooperate, that all right, if you're not competing, you're not winning. Yeah, which I think I I think any even even the most diehard of communists would actually agree that competition can be good. At some kind of at, at some level. Well, everything That's, in moderation, am I right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the competition sure can work as long as you know, not winning the competition doesn't mean, you know, Death. dying. And that's the thing is like, you you they say it's like, oh yeah, if you wanna do well, you have to play this game. It's like this game is pointlessly perilous. Like, is it even a game? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean it. Yeah. Well, it's a game to these people, but it's a, it's a yeah. death, life or death for others. Yeah. yeah. It's not really a game if you end up dying because of the game. That's not a game anymore. Well, no, 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 no. I'm saying that if you die in the game, you die in real life. No, I'm saying that to some Unlike people. Unlike Canada. To some people, <laughs> th this is this is a game because they aren't the ones who are going to die as a result of their actions. Other people yeah, are. Well, yeah, enough. because a lot of these billionaires, while well, these billionaires can invest hundreds of millions of dollars into failed experiments and just be like, oh, well, whatever. Moving on. Whereas the people who have expended their lives work on something that has failed are not going to bounce back. Mm -hmm. They just die in the street. Yep. And that's why I that's why I kind of laugh and everybody's like, oh well, we we gotta we gotta think about the small business owner. It's like, well, the small business owner is going to ultimately end up being proletariat in the in the long run because unless they happen to own multiple businesses and tend to be multi millionaires or even billionaires, if they if their business fails, that's all they have. Yeah. The dumb. Never mix up small. Um, uh, small never mix up small business. business owners and uh, billionaire corporations. I Billionaires mean, and corporations. Small business owners tend to hold to the same ideals. No, but no, they do not. They a thousand uh, percent do not. I mean, the last small business owner I had the displeasure, dis misfortune of working under kind of did. Some do, but that was a pizza but place. there's a whole other thing behind it because their ultimate goal is to make enough money so that they can have, um, they can run their business. The billionaire and the corporation's ultimate goal is to make enough, make just m so much money, just make fuck all money, and not necessarily to run the business, but to enrich themselves in the process. I don't think most small business owners are going to try to, um, you know, ex and their business in, in, in a brutal way. No, nah, but they, uh, some business owners will, you know, basically squeeze their uh, employees for every penny. Having yeah, the problem is that e even if it's only 10% of them that do act in that way... It ruins uh, it for 100% of the workers. Yeah, th their competitiveness is going to drive the other 90% out, and all that you'll get is that kind of aggressive capitalist attitude, mm -hmm. and it just it becomes and this a is refinery of sociopathy. Actually, what capitalists say will happen under communism is that we'll get people exactly like these business owners 
ruining everything for everyone. But that's a later, way later chapter. But I think the thing is, as I wanted to say, is that when people talk about, um, make bad faith arguments about, well, you know, what about small business owners that work in mom and pa's joke shop or, or whatnot, and they're just... They mean the ones that... Yeah, all these billionaires that make bad faith arguments. My whole point is that don't buy into that. There is a distinct difference between most... There's a distinct class difference between most people who own a bakery and fucking the owners of Sears. There's a huge difference. Well, you're talking about, like, sole proprietorships versus capitalists. Yes. Because a sole proprietorship doesn't use... Like, they might have an employee, maybe two. Yeah. As, um, but they're not really sole proprietorship at that point. But, like, if you own... If you don't have a capitalist that is that you work for that is exploiting you... That's like a dream that people in the proletariat just are constantly striving towards. If they can achieve it, they will. Mm-hmm. Basically, and they don't li- want to be working them in the same under group someone else's as, yolk. Uh, people that just buy capital to own companies and uh, take the income off of the profits. Well, yeah, that, totally that, there's a big difference thing. because, and a lot of capitalists like to muddy the waters and say, "Oh, there is no difference. I'm just the same as little old Joe over here," and they're not. They don't buy into that bullshit. Call them out on it and say, hey, you have a distinct difference from these other people. And you're trying to obfuscate that to make yourself look better. Yeah. Big business and small business are two very different things. Is you know, almost to be considered not even fami- similar to each other. All right. I think with that, I think we've discussed the two chapters all right. It's kind of a... Oh, wait. No, we didn't get to part five of it yet. Um, all right. We didn't even cover part four, really. Okay, we... Um, pause off my yiff, motherfucker. There we go. Well, Chapter four covered. <laughs> well, but see, part part four part and five, five, like, the the entire need for luxury is basically him just going, just kind of recap, it's just him going into the, well, this is what science is going to be, this is what literature is going to be, this is what journalism is going to be, this is what art is going to be, um... It's, it's really weird, though. At part five, he like strangely kind of pre- predicts, like Wikipedia. Furries. Yeah, it's so surreal. And then, then he gets weird. And that was part five. That was the beginning mm-hmm. of part five. It had a good strong start, but then it kind of got gatekeepery, and I didn't like that. Yeah, it just, like these two chapters, they they do feel kind of like disconnected from the rest of the work. Because even the, la- the later chapters kind of reconnect back to the first couple chapters, but these two, like, the- he see- he seems to be trying so hard and trying to quantify everything to make it seem legitimate, and for at least in term at least in terms of chapter uh, seven, mm-hmm. well, like- uh, chapter eight. Well, t- chapter- yeah, chapter eight is very uh, num- numeric. Yeah, there's numbers all over the place. And then and then chapter chapter nine is pretty much just him going like, well, this is luxury is necessary but this is this is how these specific fields are going to interact in that's the, the thing though is because it is a common kind of uh criticism against communism is that you know it'll, get, it'll have you working in your workshop and you'll come back to your shitty hovels or what have you yeah and it's like no that's not how things are supposed to shake i mean if you do if you fuck it up yeah i mean with authcom shit you could uh, totally end up with that um, mm-hmm. As he said, that, and the shit won't even be stable. He said it as much, and then it happened. But um, under anarcho-communism, you would still have time and resources to preserve interests, art, literature, yeah, science, in, uh, in science work, again. In collective work performed with a light heart to attain the desired end, a book, a work of art, or an object of luxury, each will find an incentive and the necessary, necessary relaxation that makes life pleasant. And also, in working to put an end to the division between master and slave, we work for the happiness of both, and for the happiness of humanity. And also, there you know some pretty great inventions that were, you know, made for the betterment of humanity, not solely for profit. For example, like you know, penicillin. Yeah, exactly. And he makes a most good- inoculation. Well, Although Connor counter- was actually released to be fr- was actually released as free at the be- at its inception, and now it's like hundreds of dollars for single yeah. action. Well, yeah, Fuck that's you, the thing. Like, you, like people always talk about capitalism and innovation. Capitalism is not innovation. Capitalism there are is making counter money examples, of- though. Capitalism is such ma- as the money. airplane. Nah. Yeah, the air- the the um 
the Wright brothers were very shrewd capitalists, even... Th that that with was one a labor of love by people in their spare time. Like, this is the perfect example of chapters 8 and 9, is the Wright brothers, because they worked in a... They owned a bicycle shop, and then in their spare time, they built an airplane. It didn't make money off of the airplane, really. That wasn't... On the contrary, one of them actually pretty much stressed himself to death defending the patent. Yeah, that was... Yeah, but that was so after, it's that very was after clear they that built after it. the airplane was invented, some of that really good motive went away. Yeah. A more clear counter... I guess a more clear otherwise would... It was clearer up, up until they yeah. invented it. The process of getting there. Okay, that's happening. Um, another invention that was uh, not uh, come up with altruistically was... Uh, Zephyrin Cochran's famous drive. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, he made what's more, most commonly known as the warp drive. Is that the EM drive? Or is that different? Have you ever seen Star Trek? Oh, you're talking about Star Trek. I didn't realize that. Okay. Oh, well, there's, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I missed that I'm too. Sorry, I was just I, doing I suck a at bit pop culture. Here. Holy crap. Oh, I didn't realize you were doing a bit. I thought you were being serious. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I, I think we pretty much exhausted these two, these two chapters. Um. They they weren't really the greatest chapters. They do continue. I liked I liked the luxury one. Yeah, I liked chapter nine. That was a pretty good one. Chapter eight was a little bit like. I have yeah. issues with chapter nine, part five. But aside from that, is there anything else we want to kind of throw out there before we close up the chat episode? Donate to us on Patreon. We're going to start producing premium content pretty soon. So if you want to get in on that, like, share, and subscribe. Hopefully, we'll get some more. We'll get some. Uh, people to come on the show and we can talk talk to them about theory and things like that i'm literally talking to someone right now so we can talk about more things and if you have any questions or comments you can drop them right below on our soundcloud we're, we're, we try, we tend to actually keep a keep an eye out on all the comments we do so. yeah whether it be on soundcloud youtube whatever i am the gecko i'm confite i'm carden i'm silicath and this was the bread pill suppository it's gonna be interesting uh what names we come up for it in the future like what what is it going to be next episode